please. Um, Gina Hackenworth. Debbie Haley. Okay, I'm going to Present. Jeanette Kochner. Scott Kochmeyer. Here. Ian Coons. Here. Rick Masterson. James Pauley. Brian Hunman. Here. Dick Ruffar. Here. Robert Schmidt. Here. James Hagoni. Here. Time to accept a motion for approval of the May 17th minutes. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> this time I would open up public comment. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, obviously, tonight we're going to look at the 2018 through 2020 TIP applications. We'll do four of the municipalities this evening with the balance next month. More than likely, those next month will probably have more, or do have more applications in this group. We'll try to split them up as best we can, but some of the sponsors couldn't even be here tonight. So, uh, you want to speak before we get started? Or? Sure. Um, just to kind of go through the way the book played out real quick, um, the cities are in alphabetical, well, you can kind of see it, you've got the minutes. The, guidelines, the project map, and then the scoring sheet. I will be producing that after next month's meeting, so we'll put that in um, before the work session meeting. And then the cities are alphabetized, and then behind the first city tab, it's just a list of the projects they've applied for. If there's more than one, they're in order of the city's um, preference, and then the projects are tabbed behind that. So pretty straightforward. Any questions? If not, we will start with the City of Garden Prairie. Uh, no shoulder, 
and uh, there's a 90 degree curve in there. Uh, just to the left of this picture, there is a uh, development that uh, was built about 15 years ago. In anticipation of these road improvements, the city asked the developer, the property owner uh, at that time, to uh, dedicate enough right of way so that a, a roundabout could be built at this uh, corner. So this is a uh, brook lane here that goes back into a residential neighbor to actually two residential neighborhoods, and uh, and then Weldon Spring Road itself. Is so that what you're proposing that a roundabout there? Right. Mm -hmm. Like last year, right? Yep, it's been in the plan for about 15 years. <laughs> and then uh, continue on down along, along the road. Uh, this is the, the east west leg of the road. Uh, pretty typical of really what most of the road looks like. And to uh, widen the road, uh, to build three lanes uh, because of the number of intersections and the number of driveways and also the locations of the intersections. If we went with the two lane and then uh, turn lanes, the road would go in and out uh, quite a bit. And uh, to me, it seems to make uh, more sense to go with the, with the uh, middle turn lane. And then uh, curb and gutter, underground storm sewers, and a sidewalk on one side of the street, a multi-use trail on the other. We do have a, a multi-use trail on Hemming Road, which tees into Weldon Spring, uh, that multi-use trail connects into the trail system that is uh, along Darden Creek, which is part of the Greenway network uh, that Great Rivers Greenway built. Uh, there's two parks down there. Uh, one's 92 acres, that's Bear Haven, Bear Haven, Bear Haven, and the other one is Bluebird Meadow Park, that one's 75 acres. We both have trails along the creek, and Henning Road Trail connects into those. We plan to make this connection. Um, it would open up a uh, trail network to uh, quite a few neighborhoods uh, and uh, the trail system that's there in the parks. Okay, I mentioned the roundabout there at the Niagara Bend in uh, intersection of right. And uh, just to mention, uh, no aesthetic enhancements are proposed. Typical section. Mentioned the sidewalk on one side and the trail on the other. We pulled the, uh, the trail costs out uh, and are not including that in the funding uh, request. The really non transportation, non sidewalk improvement. Uh, these are the things that we would expect to, that would be achieved from uh, implementing the project. We have uh, turning movements at at the intersections, there's uh, quite a few neighborhoods along the, the route, and uh, the road is very hilly. We'd be uh, leveling out the hills to improve sight distance, uh, putting in the roundabout at the 90 degree bend. Um, and that I mentioned the uh, connecting the neighborhoods. Um, there's also a uh, John Weldon Elementary School on Weldon Spring Road as well, and then uh, several businesses with our uh, industrial park. 64 West Business Park would also be uh, connected uh, with those type of movements. And there's the uh, funding that we're asking for, uh, taking out the trail, the improvements, it uh, drops a little bit below a 90% request, 11% uh, city. We did put in a, a request to East West Gateway funding, a recommendation for funding. Just to, and this is, this is really, I just put these in here just to uh, give you an idea of uh, some of the issues that we'll be dealing with uh, because of all of the uh, existing neighborhoods that have been built along the road. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming down and see how close the grades are getting to uh, homes. Uh, we did have to take into account in multiple locations where we'll have uh, retaining walls. The Niagara Bend. The uh, additional right-of-way that was acquired over there uh, is over here in this corner, and uh, then the grading, again, very tight. This would, we would definitely not grade up into here, where the uh, the red is shown, or it's, it is shown grade, but that would become a uh, retaining 
optimal situation. That's kind of like that in, in uh, multiple locations where the grades just, it's kind of a hilly spot in Durham Gray, the one of the more uh, rolling areas. And the, uh, Goals of the project to increase safety, improve site distance, uh, improve the uh, bring the site signing up to the standards. Uh, so we'd be striping the road. Right now it's not striped, it's more like a, a county road, almost a, a rural type uh, setup currently. Uh, pedestrian bike facilities, improving the clear zone. I uh, mentioned that not specifically, but we have lots of areas where the road just drops off and we don't have the, the, the clear zone. And uh, then uh, we would plan to uh, come back uh, after the project is completed and let you know how that's uh, improved the uh, travel that can be started with the city in St. Charles County. It's starting for residents and not the ones in St. Charles County. Here we go. Any questions? Okay. On, the, on your appendix C here, you got this breakdown in 7.68. The contingency is a million dollars. Is that high for? Um, you kind of line out all these construction costs, inflation. I mean, it's 13 percent. Um, I don't think the. Looking back and how this was put together, it's the, there hasn't been a like a um, there hasn't been a, a study that's been done to or preliminary plans that have been put together. So it's uh, all of each of the estimates that were put together. There wasn't a whole lot of data back behind it. Just the uh, experience of other road projects and what we're expecting to uh, to happen on this project and different things that we'll, that we'll experience. Uh, so that was taken. Into account. All right, that's fine. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. All right, I have a, uh, a board of all the meetings, so I've got to take off. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Good. Next up is the city of West St. Louis. Good afternoon, my name is Derek Castle. I'm the public works director for the city of Lake St. Louis. Um, we have one application to present to you. It's the Lake St. Louis Boulevard uh, Veterans Memorial I-70 stunt ramps roundabout. This uh, project was something that we were in front of you last year requesting money for a study. Uh, that study was funded. And so I'm going to start with a little bit of discussion summarizing the study and then get into what we want to do going forward. Um, the location that we're talking about here is uh, Lake St. Louis Boulevard, eastbound ramps of I-70, of I and Veterans Memorial. Um, we've got the Uptown District, the uh, Old Central Business District of Lake St. Louis. Um, got the hospital right over here. Both colonists. Our study area was focused on this half of the interchange with um, a lower level analysis of what happens on the north end of the interchange when we make changes down here. The problems we're trying to address with this project are uh, the two closely spaced intersections of these signals right here. They're very closely spaced. The bubble service is uh, a C and a D, which is acceptable, um, but we have problems that are created with the proximity associated with uh, conflicting cues and not enough room to make maneuvers between the signals. So the operations of the signals are not well reflected by those levels, sort of level service calculations. Um, uh, 
in, in peak hour, because of those problems with queues and, and the maneuvering areas, we've got a combined delay of 45 seconds per vehicle during the peak hour. Um, and, and that's, you know, I'll show you later on how much we can improve that. That's, that's not very good. And, and we're taking two signals where we have delays at two signals and combining them into one intersection, which is another, another way we can improve the area. Uh, safety is kind of a, a benefit that kind of come along, comes along. Uh, for the ride, 49 crashes in the last five years is not particularly bad, but uh, we, we can't improve that. Um, I'm going to take a little history lesson here. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, MoDOT did uh, an EIF for I-70. They looked at all the improvements on the I-70 corridor uh, through the region. Uh, Lake St. Louis Boulevard intersection was studied, and the proposals they had for it um, you can see they've got a roundabout plot here in the middle of the central business district, wiping out three or four businesses. Uh, another configuration that just wipes out the business district. Uh, another, and this uh, single point that, that encroaches into the front yards of these businesses so much it has a major impact on, on them as well. We thought we could do better than these. Um, we've been thinking about what we could do for the last 10 years. We finally had this idea of these roundabouts, and, and that's what we're talking about. So we started out the study with some very rudimentary sketches, hand sketches to give the designers an idea of what can we fit in this area, and what am I going to input into the models. Um, we did this study on a shoestring budget, and this is how we did it. We started out real rough. They used these. Um, Sketches, the first concept was two closely spaced roundabouts. The second uh, an out, uh, alternate was a single larger roundabout. They used these sketches to um, get the information they needed to input into the computer model. Uh, once we looked at the results from those computer models, we were able to uh, look at which one A or B was going to be a, probably a, a better alternative to pursue further. Um, because of some of the operational characteristics of the roundabout and how it coordinates with the uh, northern half of the interchange. Uh, we ended up really having to use this larger roundabout. The two closely spaced roundabouts work well on their own, but they don't fit into the overall road, um, road network. So we pursued that further and, and did a, uh, put that into CAD, made certain that everything fits, that it looks like it will fit within a right-of-way, it fits very well within the right-of-way. Very little right-of-way acquisition is necessary, just a little bit right here at Hardy's. Look at turn movements for trucks. Trucks can get through there, no problem at all. Um, so, what, so how well does this solve our problems? So we go from a level of service C and a level of service D, two intersections that are performing fine, but not that great. Um, we go to a single intersection that's operating a level of service A. It's a great improvement. Our, our delays go from 45 seconds per vehicle down to 5.2 seconds per vehicle. Tremendous improvement in, in moving traffic through. Um, capacity, 20-year um, traffic growth is estimated to be around 50 to 75% traffic growth. Uh, we thought that the uh, large lots up in O'Fallon on the other side of the highway uh, are probably going to add more traffic to the area than, than the other lots. Uh, south of 70, which is mostly all developed. Um, the hospital is doing additions, but most of the other um, area is all fully developed, so it's not going to have a lot of traffic. So we had, we assumed that we'd have 100% uh, growth on the north leg, 35% growth on all the other legs. Um, the roundabout can serve 100% growth in traffic. 20 years is 50 to 75, so we're great on traffic. Uh, capacity long term on this improvement on this half to interchange. Uh, and, and as I said, safety is not a major concern at this intersection, but we can improve it. Um, the roundabouts tend to improve safety, so they show about 37% reduction in crashes. Um, they're particularly effective uh, on left turn crashes. We had 60% uh, of our crashes were, were left turn crashes. Those are your severe crashes. As a summary of our financial plan. Any questions? Any 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, the city will foul. Jeff Iskewicz, I'm Assistant City Engineer at the City of O'Fallon, and also uh, Jeff Schufer is with me tonight. We're both going to be presenting on uh, the applications we've got in for the 2018 uh, snow round. Uh, we've got four projects that we've submitted. We've got them ranked up here in the order of our priorities. Uh, the first one of those being Hall Road Improvements Phase 2. Uh, then we've got followed by Bryan Road, West Terra Lane, and the I-70 Interchange, which is a design application. Uh, number three is the I-70 Outer Roads Phase 1 and cost overruns associated with that. And uh, following number four is the I-70 South Outer Road connector from the South Outer Road to Veterans Memorial Parkway. Uh, just kind of a, just an overall map of where these projects are located, just to give you an idea within the city and the region. Uh, the Hoff Road Improvement Phase Two project, of course, out on Hoff Road up in this area, as you can see. The Bryan Road Interchange located in this area. We've got the I-70 South Outer Road connector down through here. And then the overruns associated with the I-70 project, the outer road project in that location. Uh, first one needs to be in the Hoff Road Improvement Project Phase 2. Uh, the location here, as you can see, it kind of it follows up being Phase 2. Phase 1 is an application we received last year, which Phase 1 of the project took us from just north of the railroad tracks over to Progress West. And now this project kind of picks up where that one left off. We head north on there. It's about uh, a little over three quarters of a mile where we end over near uh, 1082 uh, Hoff Road, which is uh, the city's property. We've got a water tower located in this area just to kind of give you some landmarks through there. Uh, the existing conditions on this is similar to our phase one projects. The existing road section is two 11 foot lanes. There's really some severe edge drop offs. We've got some undermining of the pavement. Uh, the crash data, we've had some accidents out here. They're not as severe as phase one, but we keep hearing reports of people do get off the roadway and just happen either to right themselves or get their vehicles out without police reports being filed. So I think probably the crash data, there's a little more than what the records really show. Uh, the scope of the project for this one is a design right away in construction, where we'd be looking at similar to our phase one. We'd be widening out to two 12-foot lanes with two, uh, with two foot shoulders on each side with rumble stripes just to, to give a little bit of an audio and a, a physical sense that people know that they're on the edge of the road. Uh, we'd also be looking at, and I'll show you on some of the other the slides coming up, Looking at the horizontal and vertical alignment, there's a curve near 1067 Hoff Road that's got a little bit of a vertical and a horizontal challenge to it. I think we can make things a little bit better out there. Uh, some of our performance measures on that really just looking at the widening on that, just kind of tracking out there, really paying attention if the project goes through, seeing what the accident rates are out there, and really just kind of getting from some of the folks that use the road, getting some feedback from them. Uh, typical section we'd be looking at here, we indicated, would be basically two 12-foot lanes with a two-foot shoulder. We'd be maintaining the open ditches. We'd probably be looking into this area too, making sure we stabilize this a little bit better on both sides to eliminate any of the future undermining that we're seeing now where the stormwater comes off and erodes that edge. Uh, this is some of the pavement condition data we had. We actually had Transmap come out and drive our city early in 2017. You can see this is some of the pavement condition indexes that we had. Out there it ranged from about a 48 up to an 81. We had one section right through here where we've got some, uh, there's some, I wouldn't say severe, but it's getting pretty bad on the rutting on the edges of the road. I've got some photos to show you that that coupled with the narrow lanes, once you get over there, kind of tends to pull the vehicles off towards the ditch in those areas. So that's something along with the widening, we'd be correcting some of the efficient pavement issues in that area. Uh, some of the photos starting here, this is kind of up on the northern limits of our project. This is the entrance there at 1082 to our water tower. We'd be starting the projects right a bit off the edge of this. You can see this area is not too bad. There's some area we stabilized a little bit with some riprap through that area to contain that. Uh, as you're heading down the road, this is the, the curve I was talking about at 1082 where there's a home right here. There's Kremer Court that goes back in this area, which you can barely see that there is truck traffic that comes out of. And this hump kind of, and you're a little bit blind coming around that corner. So what we would hope to do with this project, we'd be taking some of the vertical out of that and also taking this roadway and trying to flatten that curve out, actually cutting through this embankment and heading over that direction with it. And with that, there would be some right-of-way acquisition that would have to go on up in that area. 
Uh, this is kind of continuing down. This is another one with kind of that the residential property behind Primner Courts back over here. We'd be looking at kind of bringing the alignment through here and over in this direction along with adjusting that vertical. And that's another photo on the left there. You can see kind of how high up that is and we've got some room to play with. This driveway comes up to the residential structure that's here. So realigning through this area and dropping that down some shouldn't have too much impact there and probably make their driveway much safer in that area. Uh, this is, and you can kind of see looking back, this is on that same vertical curve. This is some of the area where we're experiencing probably some of the worst uh, erosion at the edge and we're losing that edge of pavement. We've had a couple reports of vehicles getting off in that, so once they're off there, some of that's probably about two and a half to almost three foot in some areas. So with our widening, we've got additional right of way on most of the side on the east side of the road, so we're hoping to push it out that direction. But in some cases like this where we'd be seeing this, we would try to get that and actually probably come in and probably work with that homeowner to try and grade that out a little more to keep something there that's a little bit more of a viable pavement edge in that area. And this is kind of moving down a little bit further down near uh, Liberty Industrial Drive. This is some of the kind of the edge rutting that you see that's going on in some of these areas where the pavement conditions and pavement ratings are showing it. And also down here, it doesn't show up real well, but you can see kind of some of the rutting, <coughs> excuse me, and also you can kind of, see, kind of see a bit of tire marks off on the pavement also for the truck traffic and then probably some passenger vehicles that are passing through there have gotten off the roadway. Uh, this is some more of that that shows a little bit different angles, kind of working our way south as we go. Some more of the edge rutting that we've got going on. You can kind of see there are some tire marks and things there that we're hoping to. With this, our widening, this would occur, this is the east side here. Looking here, this is the east side over here that we'd be looking to widen to that side. We do have right of way. However, there are some utilities that are in right of way, but they were there before the right of way was dedicated. So they're within easement, so there will be some right of way or utility relocates that would have to happen to accommodate the widening. Uh, this is a little bit further down. Uh, this picture, you can see where we'd be starting. Progress West is located right in this area, so we'd be starting about here, taking off. Phase one goes that direction. Uh, this photo just, uh, once again, demonstrates some of, some of the edge issues we're having off there, and just the truck traffic and wheel traffic that gets off on that. Uh, and as far as the project goes, kind of here's our cost breakdown for that. We're looking for the 80-20 split on this. Uh, there's some numbers there. I'll read through them. You can see them. Uh, any questions on this one or anything I can answer for anyone? All right. Let's on to the next one. Uh, this will be our Bryan Road, West Terra Lane, and I-70 interchange. Uh, this one we're looking at, the location is the Bryan Road interchange on I-70 and also then the West Terra intersection on the north side of that interchange. Uh, what this application for is uh, for design only since there's a lot of components here that we need to figure out if we're going to get our design locked in first before we really get too far into it because there will be some right-of-way challenges and other issues that we want to have worked out and get a good number before we move on to the right-of-way acquisition or construction phase. Uh, really with this project, what it is, the close proximity to uh, the West Terra Lane to the I-70 westbound on and off ramps. There's only about 325 feet between those signals. And in the evening rush, when we've got everybody coming basically on the westbound track, it gets heavier. That starts to back up on the westbound off ramp. And then also, we kind of time that with uh, St. Dominic when they get out on the West Terra. Sometimes that backs up. There's a fairly lengthy queue on that also. So some of this, where we're going to basically try and pull the West Terra intersection back to the north. And then also look at designing going at the Current interchange is a standard configuration. We'd be looking at changing that over to a diverging diamond, something similar like you see at the Mid Rivers inter or interchange. Uh, and some of this, our performance measure on this, looking at really providing better traffic flow through that area to accommodate the future traffic volumes, improve the safety, and also, I got some slides we'll show you, what this will provide for a future connection for the phase three, we're calling phase three of the Deer Creek Extension Project. Uh, as you can see here, this is kind of an overview of it. We've got Bryan Road. I-70. The current West Terra, you can see through here, this will be pavement we'd look at taking out. And what we'd be doing is looking, shifting that intersection back to the north about 375 feet. What we get into, there are some businesses located right, well, actually through the center here. We've got some residential property to the back. There's been some evaluations done on that. I know the right-of-way impacts are going to be a little bit challenging here, but we feel we've kind of worked with the county. This is probably one of our better scenarios. There were some other scenarios that played out kind of with a uh, a double roundabout through this area, but it, that in itself presented some more challenges. It didn't seem to be, I guess, the most efficient design for this, but there's some things we'll look into as we go further on. And then kind of dovetailing into what would be the future phase, 
three of the Deer Creek extension. Just this last year in 16, the Deer Creek extension was completed from Lane Drive over to Deer Creek, which provided a north-south connector to them from the outer road to Highway P. Uh, what this would do, the future phase of this was, was it's been planned for some time now, we would actually connect into this point here, and this is the future phase of it. We would connect to this point, and then that Deer Creek extension would head to the north. Connect in right now, the plan was with a roundabout on the, what's the new Deer Creek extension, and that would provide another uh, north-south connector from Highway P to I-70, and kind of get some of the traffic off of, because right now the north-south connector is there, but it takes it through a residential area here, We've got a uh, St. Dominic in this area, uh, industrial area here, so this will provide a, a little bit cleaner route for that north-south traffic. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of more of a blow-up of the area that we're looking at. Uh, some of the just kind of the images here. Looking straight down, this is an image taken from right about the intersection here, looking into <coughs> to the north for the properties that are located right in here. So some of this we'd be looking extending right back through here. And that takes us back into kind of this area here where we'd have to be some of our heavy right-of-way acquisition will be looking back in that area to come through here and then extend out and over with our stuff. Uh, just some of the some little bit of photos to kind of show you what's going on out there. This is at the West Terra Lane intersection and then as you can see within 300 feet we've got the signal then for the, the westbound on and off ramp. So it's a fairly congested area that's fairly tight, a lot of signals in a close proximity there don't tend to function too well together. And with the increasing volumes over time, it's only going to get worse. Uh, and this is on a Veterans Memorial, or a little bit before that, really more or less on the, the eastbound off-ramp, looking to the north at the intersection there, where we'd be looking at converting this existing over, uh, overpass into a diverging diamond interchange there. There would probably be some widening that would be required with the bridge, so that's something we'd have to take into account also. Uh, these are some of the shots on West Terra. This is West Terra looking east. The car dealership is kind of just over the shoulder of this photo, the RV dealer. What we'd be looking at with our realignment, we would start in this area and we'd actually start to work over and the alignment would shift over and kind of head back towards this tree line. And this is on the other side of that looking east, so kind of on the opposite side. The same thing we'd be looking at coming through here and we'd start to shift over in order to pull that intersection back heading in that direction. Uh, as far as the, the, what we're looking for, since this is just a design-only application, the final design products we'd be looking for, we'd hope to have a project, you know, basically ready to go to construction after this. So that would include our preliminary plans right away, the final construction plans, AJR documents, our NEPA documents, utility coordination, open houses, and then getting a good feel on determination and appraisal of the affected property. And then our cost breakdown for the projects, as you can see here. Uh, read that and if you got any questions on this one be more than happy to answer okay all right on to the next one uh, this is our i-70 uh, outer road connector from south outer road veterans memorial parkway or from south outer road to veterans memorial parkway uh, this one we've submitted last year to some of you may be familiar with this uh, the location of this is on veterans memorial just east of sandra and we'd be looking into connecting into the future I-70 outer road. So the outer road would be constructed. This project would come in, you know, before or after, and we can work out the tie-in points on that just based on timing. Just kind of some relation. Uh, the Slumberland stores in this area may help you out as kind of get yourself oriented to the location of the project. Uh, this one, uh, the existing conditions, currently the I-70 project doesn't provide access to the south outer road from Sondren or Veterans Memorial. Those folks would either have to go back to Highway K to access or down to TR Hughes, so there's really not a, a good connection there. And if providing this connection, you can see a slide I got later, it actually provides a pretty good connection. There's an area that that would serve north of I-70 by the way of Sondra, and also some areas south of I-70 coming up Sondra. Uh, the scope of the project, we're looking at providing a, a short two-lane connector. This would involve both uh, design, right-of-way, and construction. Uh, the performance majors on this, I think it would really, it's one of those, it's being a new road, it's going to provide as a backage road basically to uh, Highway K and TR Hughes. So I think really this would be a vital connector that would help would help the residents access and maybe stir some economic development in areas near. Uh, this is kind of the you see that kind of phase or falls in with the I-70 outer road project that's currently hopefully going to construction early next year. It's in the right-of-way phases right now. With the south outer road that would come through, 
currently anybody who I was indicating earlier from Sondran, you would have to actually go up home and come down back to Veterans over and up and then get on the outer road to access 70 or come out. That's a kind of a lengthier route the other direction. This would actually give you a way by Sondran to BMP, they can jump on here then provides access by way of a slip ramp onto eastbound I 70. And then this would actually serve areas to the south and this area to the north. So that would help alleviate some of the trips and eliminate some of that uh, traffic and volume through the K and I 70 interchange and then further down at, at I 70 and TRU. Uh, this is kind of just looking at, we've laid out a little bit kind of a, a rough section through there, some of the grading. It's not too bad, it's fairly flat, so it's a fairly simple connection to make. Uh, there's a section we'd be looking at through there. <clears throat> and these are just some photos looking at it. This was looking looking east on BMP. Slumberland is right here. The connection would be to the left of this photo. And this one's looking west, where the connection would be just to the right on there. And then these two are looking at the alignment where it would be. One of these taken from BMP looking north. Then the other one is looking south from about just the edge of the I-70 uh, right away, current right away, about where the, the outer road would be placed once it's constructed. And once again, here's our cost breakdown for that. Another 80-20 split is what we're proposing. And we weren't happy to field any questions at this time. Where's the majority of the right away coming from? Majority of the right away will be coming from this undeveloped property here. We're, we're looking if we could see, you know, if we can try to split some of that problem is with their access point there, we try to push it this way, we may have to look at realigning their access point onto this road, which we really don't want to do. So at this point in time, you know, we're kind of a little bit, it's a little bit up in the air where it will come from. You kind of split, we got the two properties here, so it may, you know, to try and shift it to get away from this, we would have it more on this property, or if there's something with the design, we can work it out to incorporate that access onto here, we can push it that way and possibly split between the two properties. Either way, we'd be looking at acquiring there. Is this property currently zoned? We don't have any current plans or haven't received anything for development on that. So at this point, if we go to acquire, we'd have to purchase that from them. It gives them greater access, so to me, it improves their property. It does, but until they would come in, we really can't can't right. force their hands with something we would have to, yeah, to acquire. So if, yeah, if it would happen to come in for development, yeah. prior to yeah. being yeah. built, yeah. that would be a development requirement. But that's kind of forcing the nature of the beast and the way it works. So. Anybody else? All righty. Well, that one off. Turn it over to Jeff for our last one. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my name is Jeff Schuper with the City of Oak Island. Um, I'm here to present specifically on this project. Uh, the reason that I'm presenting on this is because I've been basically involved with the I-70 Auto Road project since 2008 or 9. So I have a pretty big history with it, and, and so I, I kind of work with them to say, ah, you know, I know the most about the project, so I'll present on this particular one. So that said, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the purpose of this application is to cover some cost overruns that we've uh, been anticipating and, and kind of documenting on our own. Now, this is tied to an existing project, one that came through the County Road Board a couple of years ago, and I guess in pursuit of what occurred in the fall with uh, the county highway department coming with some a couple of projects for cost overruns we are we're doing the same thing here uh, so this particular project it's it's basically the same project that jeff just discussed the limits it's along i-70 between woodlawn overpass and the trq's interchange there uh, we came back we came to the county back in 2014 and our current agreement is from 2015 for funding on this particular project. Uh, so a summary of that project is the conversion of existing outer roads into a one-way outer road system, construction of a new south outer road. Uh, those are all one way with the new project, construction of slip ramps, as well as some Texas U-turns on the project. So it is one that has been previously presented on. Some of the benefits of that project is to reduce the overall traffic at the interchanges. Uh, this would be similar in nature to some of the other, uh, you know, the county project, the one at Fifth Street, for example, where you can take that traffic, slip it on and off, 
of the highway and let that traffic disperse so that it doesn't just clog up your interchanges. Uh, one of the goals that has been outlined with all of these I-70 Outer Road projects is to stimulate economic development. Um, as we've heard in the past, there's a lot of vacant properties with I-70 frontage. There's a lot of old development that could uh, use a little vitalization. And so the goal is to try to get all those updated so that we can have those sales tax in the county. We'll be building a brand new South Outer Road. Uh, as part of that, one of the parcels that's adjacent to our new South Outer Road is a former mobile home park. We've had a couple of different uh, potential developers over the last couple years come in and talk to us about that piece. And we've been telling them about this project and, and they've been interested in it. Uh, you know, uh, so it, it is getting out there that this, that this project will help build that roadway where there is currently not one. We also eliminate a traffic signal with the project. Uh, that would be one of the close intersections there right on Main Street. So a similar thread to what we talked about uh, earlier with Lake St. Louis having that uh, issue, as well as the Bryan Road interchange that we're also applying for. Um, the Texas U-turns could also eliminate use of the signals. Uh, we actually ran kind of a scenario on our own that really with the proposed project, you could make some movements with zero traffic signals that under today's conditions, you'd have to go through two or three of them, maybe even four in some cases. So we're really excited about having fewer signals to go through. Um, one of the things that we're, we're also gonna have to do is build a median along Highway K, just south of the interchange. Uh, we're having three lanes of traffic in each direction along this section, and MoDOT has, has basically mandated that a median goes in there to restrict crossing three lanes of traffic without any protection. So that will help remove one of the areas, the pockets right in front of a, an Arby's restaurant. It's one of the highest areas where there's the most accidents in O'Fallon. And so that will greatly reduce the, those accidents for long-term safety. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is a continuation of countywide plan. Some of you may remember years ago, St. Peter's was approached for one way out of roads and then O'Fallon was approached, and then St. Charles has had their project built here. And uh, I do believe that initiative countywide does continue as it will take many years to work on it. Um, the city, we're fully committed to this project. Uh, we've been presenting to the public for several years. We've had three or four open houses with the public. I have personally met with business owners over the last few years to get their support. Um, and we have been you know, advertising this on our website. We've been uh, we're fully engaged with design as it is right now, and, and right of way is underway. Uh, so we're completely in, in with this project. And we also have a, you know, city council has supported this by means of a resolution back in 2014. Uh, this, was, this was greatly beneficial as we sought additional grant funds back then uh, to continue with this project. Um, so the reason for this application is to cover some overruns. Uh, this project basically, when we were, back in 2014, when we were discussing concepts, it was cast in a mold of the $16 million project. There's nothing wrong with that, per se. You have to have an estimate, uh, especially if you're applying for grant funds and trying to set budgets. But there were a lot of things that really, until we secured design and started getting into the weeds of, of detailed design, there were things that we didn't anticipate. Uh, some of the federal fund applications that were put together uh, were, were kind of phrased to where there wasn't a serious amount of right-of-way acquisition that was going to be needed. Uh, where we're currently at today, we have a lot, you know, as I got further down there, we have quite a few parcels. I think we were initially thinking five or less at the time and only TCE, temporary construction easement, but now we're, we have, you know, 10 or 11 parcels plus sound wall parcels that we had to interact with. Um, utility relocation, that was another one. You know, the detail of that is really hard to estimate at a concept level until you can get uh, all the utilities on board with where their facilities are at. So stuff like that has really uh, come out and proven to be a bigger beast than what we thought. Uh, the design, so the actual design contract was almost $2 million higher than what we had thought the design was going to be back in uh, the, you know, 2014 and 15 when we were estimating that. Uh, I talked about right-of-way there. So we have 
out of the 11 parcels, only one has signed to date, and all the rest are going to have to go to condemnation. So when you go to condemnation, it's a wild card as far as what the commissioners could award on that. So we were, we're trying to brace ourselves for what that could end up being. Construction itself, uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, with the median, the median was brought on us by MoDOT staff after we had hired the designer. And as a result of that, and, and having a bunch of access cut off, uh, one of our roads, and I'll show you on the, on the next slide, but McDonald Lane is a side street that connects McDonald's, a dirt cheap, and it's also a back way to get through the Aldi's and connect over to Veterans Memorial. Well, that will now be cut off uh, from left turn access. So what we have proposed is a new road uh, right next to a little Pool King store that's there that would help uh, basically mitigate the loss of left turns. So that's one of the construction components with this to try to make that uh, better for those businesses. Uh, we had a couple other detailed items. Some, some of the walls were coming in at a higher estimate than what, our, uh, what we initially thought. So that was a recent discussion with MoDOT based on other <coughs> projects. And we also have a water line relocation due to conflicts with some other uh, guardrail and signal equipment. So we'll kind of go into that. Um, this is the current overview map, uh, similar to the one that, that Jeff showed a few minutes ago, but this shows the limits. Um, I also have on here, and just like what Jeff talked about, here's that uh, connector road that, uh, that's on the previous project, but I won't get into that. But the limits are shown here, and basically this is the phase one limits. Um, this section over here in, in the purple line work, this is our pending phase two limits uh, that we're currently in the process of trying to get uh, county road board agreements in place on that. So uh, that is outside of the limits of this particular project. So everything I'm talking about with phase one is just in this, in this footprint here, um, outside of this project and outside of this project. Um, but McDonald Lane is right in this area here that I mentioned. And I have another uh, picture of that that I'll show you here. Uh, so this is basically the zoom-in section. Uh, this is I-70 and Highway K. So this yellow line is the proposed median. It's going in right through this area here. So McDonald Lane will be fully cut off from left turns in. Currently, as it's signed today, uh, there are no southbound lefts allowed out of McDonald's, but the signage says, oh, come over here and use all these uh, to get out of that area. Uh, all of these roadways are private roads or uh, private cross access through here, uh, but all of these businesses are shared with that. So what we are proposing to do is uh, build this roadway. This is the Pool King store right here. And this is a, an auto tire uh, mechanic shop right there. We're proposing to build this uh, roadway right here. This is a one-way road in, so that cars, you know, instead of coming down here to turn left in, which they can do today, it's a very hard movement. But this is that most highly accident area here in O'Fallon. But the cars could come down here, turn left, and they could come into here and uh, have access to the entire area this entire commercial area um, we initially looked at just having like a right in right out on the mcdonald's property uh, but the problem we have with that is you know we would actually secure this as a as a um, as a city roadway instead of having all of it go through uh, this private area here mcdonald's wasn't too inter interested in, in, in doing that so, and it would also, they have a dumpster and drive through lane start over here too. So we didn't, we didn't, they didn't like the idea of getting impacted there. But this would completely mitigate the loss of left turns here. And then cars can still come out and go right northbound like they do today and it's no different. Um, so this is actually that scenario I mentioned, is you could exit the highway way back here, closer to TR Hughes, go around this, go through the Texas U-turn, come around here and come in and access all of these businesses without a single traffic light to stop you. So, but that would only be if that road was built. <coughs> this road is not built. The only way to access these from the south would be to come up to Veterans Memorial Parkway, turn left, and then come in through the Aldi parking lot. But I'll tell you, on any given afternoon, this parking lot is, is pretty jam-packed and really, you know, especially with the loss of access here, it, it's, it would, quite a bit of volume on that on that roadway. 
Uh, another topic I mentioned was the soil nail wall. Um, so basically what a soil nail wall is, is, is you, you, build, you excavate your, your soil embankment, you put pins into the dirt, and then you basically use shot creep and cover it up, and then you bolt it on, and then you put on this, basically the surface panel uh, to that. Uh, so the, the structure is more in the stuff behind this. Uh, this is a common ashlar style wall. This is not an aesthetic enhancement. This is just their MoDOT standard style that they use all over the St. Louis district. Um, but these would have to be built under the underpass because they can't build the soldier pile walls, which soldier pile, they actually pound them into the ground and they insert panels in between. Uh, soldier piles are much cheaper, uh, but the estimates over, you know, double from 50 to 120 dollars a foot, uh, so that kind of caught us off guard as we were, you know. Here, then these numbers are coming from Modot's recent did did tabs. Uh, so you know, two years ago we were thinking a lot cheaper on that, and we do have these are the walls that are going to be underneath the overpass for the Texas U-turn and underneath some of the other overpasses by Sandra. Can you go back one slide, please. Yeah, that blue is that part of this overround or is that? A later uh, this addition. here yes um, this is actually going to be a, a separate project altogether uh, we're, we're it's not really part of this application it's a proposal we would we would certainly like it to be part of it because it is a direct consequence of this median in here but I guess you know if, if you guys thought that yeah we shouldn't pay for that then I guess we can probably settle that out and for this is it almost 1.9 is it in this um, what you're what you're asking for? I think on maybe the let me go to one of my last slides here where I kind of break this out. Construction, yeah, there it is, Wolf King Road right there. So it is in there. Okay. It is. Thank you. So let me go back. And use I just want, I just wonder if it was part of it or if that was a couple later. So. Yep. So we can certainly try to see if a soldier pile wall could be built, but we won't know until the project is built out at the beginning of, of next year until they have a contractor on board. This might be something they can value engineer in, but realistically to try to pile, uh, pound the piles in underneath this overpass is not practical. Um, so we feel like we're kind of stuck on the soil nail wall for these overpass bridges. Uh, Third item is the water line relocation. So what we're talking about on this, so north is actually to the left of the screen. Uh, I-70 would be right here. But uh, we have an existing water line that's kind of shown here in blue that goes underneath here. I tried to sketch in as best as I could, but we actually have a proposed guardrail. And this, this line actually got shifted on my slide here. But this, this guardrail is actually right here, right on top of the existing water main. And this traffic signal cabinet was also shown right here in this location over the main. So we were really concerned about that being not doable because the guardrail is going to separate, it doesn't show up on this image, but it actually separates, um, it's hard to see it here too, but the Texas U-turn lane that comes through, it separates that Texas U-turn lane from the northbound Highway K traffic. So the Texas U-turn will be southbound traffic, separated by a guardrail, and then northbound Highway K traffic. So with that, we identified the best place to relocate it. And actually, on this end here, our relocation would just start at this corner. Um, our maps were kind of unclear, but we actually will have water main up through this point here. So we would just connect water main down and then tie it in as soon as we can get past it. The advantage of this too is if they're, this is all under pavement, a lot, some of this is underneath the, uh, the sloped concrete wall now, but the, the new location of this water main would be underneath the Texas U-turn lane. So even if there was an emergency with the water main or a break, well then it would just shut down the Texas U-turn lane and not affect the north, northbound Highway K. So you could completely shut down that U-turn lane to work on it and just feed the traffic through the intersection. So that is kind of a summary of that. So this is a breakdown, and I had something in the application. I actually, today when I was uh, 
finalizing these slides, I realized I had a calculation error. Uh, so I'll talk about that on the next slide. So what you see in your printed application is going to be just slightly off. Uh, but this breaks down. So in, in the county road board application from two years ago, we identified here's the $16 million project, and here's how we broke up the three categories from pre-construction, letting, testing, and inspection to construction. Uh, this section kind of breaks down the actual that we're seeing today. You know, the engineering is uh, one, you know, almost one and a half million dollars. We had to hire another consultant to review sound wall for MoDOT requirements. Um, right away, we, we had to pay MoDOT because MoDOT's acquiring the right of way on this, so we had to pay them exactly this amount. I estimated uh, condemnation extra costs to them uh, for going, you know, for 20 parcels, approximate numbers, and utility locations on that water line I mentioned was also kind of estimated at uh, about $400,000. Um, construction letting, so these numbers, these are close, and this is actually what the difference is between the paper application and, and this slide is, um, this section here basically got, I laser dying, but this section kind of got left out altogether, so only $95,000 is my, uh, my bust. And then construction, so the opinion of cost here is, uh, you know, 12 million. So we only a wall estimate, the Pool King Road estimate. Uh, so in total, like these numbers here, shaded, so this green is $1.3 million difference. This total is $1.3 million different than the green number up there from the agreement. This is $95,000 different from letting up there. And this is $580,000 different from, from the estimate up there for a grand total of almost $2 million difference. So on this breakdown here, uh, the part that's different, and my asterisk fell off, but uh, uh, here for the construction, this is the, um, that letting number on the previous slide just got added in there. So I think it just basically bumps it up $95,000. Um, the project is scheduled to be bid out here sometime this winter time. We have to finish up the right of way which they're anticipating in September by the time it gets to court. And then construction would occur starting next March and last for a little over a year total. Any questions about I-70 overruns or any of the other projects? Okay. Your, your explanation up there is not the same as what's in our package. That's, yeah, this one here is slightly different, so I can certainly provide an updated sheet on this. Like I said, I was going through the slides this morning uh, and realized that this entire middle section was just left out. So I do apologize for that. Yeah, that's emailed out. Yeah. Quick overarching, your, the sheet here with the, the four projects, your prioritization, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we just had this one for so that I would just present and I would go back and forth. So. Thank you. Jeff, uh, on the Aldi Park property, is that that driveway that everybody cuts across, is that in any kind of easement? Or? It's in a cross access. It is it's a cross easement. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And all of these businesses, they all have access through here. They're all a party to that cross access. Okay. So that's why we thought, well, if we just end our road here, uh, then really the cars can get in and go wherever they want. In the past, haven't overruns been the responsibility of the sponsoring party? It's my interpretation. Typically, yes. Um, I know with the county, but that's because yeah. they don't have a sponsoring party. Yeah, just um, due to the complexity of this project and I think the fact that this this is a county, um, you know, the county wants the outer roads, the county has pushed for these projects. Um, John told the municipality that they could come back with the overruns this year. This is actually not the only one. Um, so they're in here. You obviously will vote, and if the road board decides they don't want to do that, that's fine. Um, but they're in here for discussion. But we're not violating any of the contract because. Um, I, I don't. I think that this new contract would just kind of replace the old one, we'd have to kind of work that out, but the contracts can be amended, so. 
So the 50-50 split, who came up with that number? The, I think that's just because it's a zoned out roadway, so it only pay 50%. That's traditionally been the, yeah. the max percentage on that. We'll take more if you're willing to <laughs> 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 Sorry, Cam. Yeah. <laughs> the the initial you may have said this, the initial cost estimates, how far back do they go? Uh twenty fourteen. Okay. Uh, if some of you remember back in that time, maybe even two thousand thirteen, Horner and Schifrin was hired to perform conceptual estimates throughout and they were working specifically in O'Fallon. Okay. They had developed the lion's share of these estimates. So we used all of those in putting together the federal application. So actually, even the, the East-West Gateway application for CMAC funding that St. Charles County sponsored took that $16 million and, and the different breakdowns and said, here's our project. So. Well, what was the county funding out of the 16? I think it's about, I think it's about six or so, six corners, that's not right. I don't know which number. Yeah, it's under 50%. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 we have, uh, there's MoDOT cost share funds tied in with this. Uh, there's federal CMAC funds tied in with this. Uh, there's some city match, too. Good afternoon, my name is Sue Spiegel, I'm the Director of Public Works for the City of Wentzville. Beth and myself are here today to introduce uh, two of our project applications to you. Uh, the first one is going to be a uh, right-of-way uh, application for Wentzville Parkway South and for Data Global Parkway Phase 2. Uh, the acquisition locations are um, on Wentzville Parkway South will be between Veterans Memorial Drive and Interstate Drive. Uh, that is approximately uh, 1,650 feet of, of roadway. Uh, and then for Data Global Parkway, the, the segment that we're talking about today uh, is between Goodfellow Road, which is north of Interstate 70, and the future in, uh, extension of Interstate Drive. Uh, so on this map, uh, the Wentzville Parkway South uh, extension project is right here. So this is Interstate 70, Wentzville Parkway. We're talking about an extension down to Interstate Drive. And then the other one, David Hopel Parkway Phase 2. Again, Interstate 70, Goodfellow Road here to the north. And then the extension of Interstate Drive on the south. So ultimately, Interstate Drive, is, as you can see it over here, it's going to extend and, and function as a side road uh, to their state 70. There's a lot of undeveloped land out in this area that uh, because of the geographic barriers associated with both the railroad and the interstate, uh, all we've got in that area is at grade railroad crossings and there's just a whole lot of land that's not going anywhere, not developing as a result. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on uh, the existing system and in fact in some cases, uh, you know, congestion and delay is hitting a uh, level of service F, um, failure room mode. So um, this is a picture of uh, the Wentzville Parkway South extension and the green areas here are showing uh, the, the permanent roadway right away, the permanent easement, and then the temporary construction easement. Did you hand out those? Would you like to begin? Can get out some more, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit easier to see a little by 17 if they're not included within your packet. Um, the, the existing conditions associated with 
with this project, it, right now this roadway doesn't exist. And so it functions as a three-way intersection. There's uh, the signals are very close to the space together. This is signalized, and then we have another set signal right in this location, another set of signals here. And so the, the trouble with the existing condition, the congestion uh, results from this left turn movement uh, onto the interstate and another high congestion area is associated with this left turn movement, again, to try to get to the interstate, AM and PM, uh, primarily AM. And then we, we're also seeing a lot of congestion delay developing on the Veterans Memorial Lake for the right turn um, as these inner, as these closely spaced signals are, are uh, controlled in that right turn movement. So um, another thing that uh, is occurring in this area that's associated with this project is, it may not look like it yet, but um, we also have a very short on-ramp um, to get from the parkway onto I-70, and you're kind of constrained a little bit further to the east by the railroad bridge and an S-turn. Uh, so you really have to have, uh, you know, at least a V6 in, under the hood. Um, and certainly, you know, if you're in a four-cylinder, you're going to feel a little bit uneasy about using that, that entrance ramp. Uh, so this, the, what happened, if you can go back just for a second, though, if you're able to do that. Okay, so this was the original layout for the, uh, for the roundabout. And as you can see, it didn't really impede on these developments over here. But as we went through the process with the CMAC application, um, was it FHWA that required us to so change that alignment? Some, some of the term limits there. Okay, so if you go to the next slide then. Uh, the alignment on the roundabout uh, had to be revised. And this is a picture from the CMAC application, so you don't see any of this extension here. Um, but this is more accurately what we're intending to construct uh, for this, this portion of the project. And we're starting to find uh, that it's going to probably be in our best interest to divide this project into two pieces because this one is highly CMAC eligible. If we can get the, uh, the costs to a, to a point where, uh, where it can compete. And one of the challenges that we're running into is with this new alignment, uh, it has resulted in a, a taking at Car Credit City that we weren't anticipating. That particular uh, property is currently up for sale. There's not an active car sales uh, facility or business operating there. We think it's a really good time uh, to try to get acquire that right away. And if we were able to do that, it would bring our costs down and get us to a place where we'd be much more CMAC eligible and we think we could compete in 2018 for a CMAC project to get this thing constructed. The challenge is we need the right of way. Okay, so again, just kind of, this is just a recap of the existing conditions that, that we're struggling with there, what we think we can help ourselves with. That roundabout takes, and I don't know, maybe we can go back to that picture. I like working off of that. That roundabout takes the left turn movement uh, that used to be required to come down the parkway and get on the interstate. It takes it away. Uh, it turns it into a right turn movement and it flows freely and it, and it just increases the capacity of that inter intersection tremendously. Um, that's why it's CMAC eligible and, and it, that's why it do does us so much good because not only does it relieve congestion here, but it also lengthens out that ramp and gives you a lot more time to get up to speed. So um, that kind of eliminates this issue that we're, that's associated with, with that ramp. And so then those left turns are flowing better and the proximity to the signals just really, uh, it goes away because um, you've, you've introduced that ramp. So the next slide. Uh, so our current status, some of you have been here for a while. Uh, in 2012, we did a corridor study, and we looked at the uh, <coughs> over the railroad or even an at-grade railroad crossing of four lanes. When that was completed, the cost estimate was a little bit out of reach for, for everyone. And uh, so we took another look at it in 2016 with a supplemental study. And, uh, that's pretty much where we came up with that modified uh, interchange to improve the service levels and, and all those good things. The parcels have been identified. The cost estimate uh, now 
has, has, has the opportunity for us to just go with two lane rather than four lane. Uh, grade separated is really where we're at at this juncture. Uh, we don't really see that uh, the at grade option is the way that we're going to want to go. And that's because we know economic development won't happen until they've got uh, grade separated access over that railroad. There's, a, there's 14 to 18 trains that go through there a day, and it, and it is an impediment to economic development if you don't have great separated over it. Um, so this is the one we're working on right now. The cost estimate uh, is $15 million. Uh, that's for the whole thing, and we think some of that is uh, CMAC eligible. So that, that, just to kind of recap again, the 2016 CMAC was unsuccessful. It included a pretty big number for right away. Uh, so we know we've got to We've got to solve that, uh, getting the right of way off the plate, getting it more, I guess the term I want to use is shovel ready, uh, so that uh, it's more appealing to those who are who are looking at our project from the CMAC reviewers. Next slide. Okay, so uh, Lensville Parkway South. I mean, uh, Lensville Parkway South and GHP Phase 2 right away. Um, this. If you uh, haven't seen this before, is the drawing of what it's going to look like on I-70 when that new interchange is installed. We've got a lot of undeveloped land out here. Some of it is in the city, some of it is not. Some of the property owners are more development-oriented than others. We have two, in fact, that are very development-oriented, and that's this large parcel here, which is key, and this large parcel here. We've been in right away negotiations with both of them. Uh, they are definitely both interested in working with the city and with the county because they see the, the value of this project moving forward. Right away donation has been the way that we've been going with this uh, project uh, all along. We've been approaching them uh, from the perspective of we need donation and we're not funded for right away. And the answer that we're getting from them is we understand uh, that you need donation, but we need utilities. And one of the drawbacks to this particular part of our community is uh, we don't have ready access to sanitary sewer. And economic development doesn't happen until you solve that. So we're talking about uh, working on getting permitted for casings to go under both the railroad and the interstate at the same time as we're working on getting uh, the other railroad approval and, and MoDOT approvals. Uh, those casings uh, are really what the starters, I guess, for uh, for negotiations for uh, right away with the south property. It's the, the one uh, on the south side of I-70 over here. They're looking for uh, sanitary sewer and water main casings here. Um, over here on this parcel, kind of the same types of conversations. Um, all about donating right away, but I need utilities. So what's happening to us is we're, we're in a position where we're having to provide in-kind utility access uh, instead of cash for for right away. Um, the, the trouble is there's no funding for that, and so uh, what we've done, we've gone as far as the appraisals with. Uh, with all these properties, we know what the right-of-way value, appraised value is. Uh, if, if you include the right-of-way for the interstate drive extension, the appraised value is in the neighborhood of $600,000. Uh, so using that, kind of keeping that in the back of our mind, we feel pretty comfortable that, you know, we can work something out with these, with these two development-friendly property owners. We're not certain that we're going to have as much luck with, with this particular property owner and we're concerned that we're going to have to go to condemnation for them. Um, that's the wild card. Every time you have to go to condemnation, appraised value is not normally what you pay. It can be some multiple of appraised value. Um, so that, you know, that's where we are with that. So just kind of a recap of, of where we've been with this project. It's been around for a long time. That environmental assessment and AGR was completed, um, I'm going to say in 2013. <coughs> so our right-of-way plans are 100% complete. The construction plans, final construction plans are about 80% complete. We've looked at, again, with this project, because it's very large, um, 
the scope of it has changed on us. This really isn't a cost uh, overrun project. It may look like it to you when uh, when you see this number. Some of you might remember something closer to an $18 million number. It is now a $23 million number. Some of the reasons for that are that the FHWA uh, has insisted that we build all four ramps. Our original idea was that we would build two of the four ramps, and so that was a scope change. The other thing that has happened is FHWA is requiring MoDOT to do all of the construction inspection. And right now, that's planned to go to a consultant because of MoDOT's funding condition, and they just don't have the in-house staff that they used to have. They lost a lot of talent. So 7% of the project is, has added over a million dollars just in construction inspection costs to where we thought we might be. Our original intent was to be going at this and applying uh, our in-house staff. We had, and we still have, uh, some very talented ex MoDOT employees that know how to do this kind of work. Uh, but because of the limitations associated with FHWA's rules, uh, we're, it doesn't look like we're going to have that opportunity. Uh, some of the other things that we're doing, we are uh, actively seeking an, a memorandum of understanding with the railroad. Uh, we, we want to offer to close an at-grade crossing in exchange for this uh, over, over the railroad crossing on David Hobel Parkway, and that does come with some funding participation. We're hoping it can be as much as uh, almost $400,000 uh, for uh, additional funding, and that would include uh, about $35,000 as well from MoDOT Multimodal, I believe, is the group uh, that has a little bit of money there. Uh, other things that we're doing, um, because the scope did change, and we went from an 18 million to a 23 million dollar project, uh, we are actively pursuing the MoDOT cost share program. We're in fact filing an application for five million dollars. The applications are due at the end of this month. Uh, we're seeking letters of support out of MoDOT, East West Gateway. St. Charles County uh, for that application, and uh, that's how uh, we're hoping uh, to fund the, the, uh, the shortfall that we're experiencing with the growth of our scope. So the outcomes, uh, there's all kinds of good things that, that will happen, uh, not just reduce travel delay and congestion, uh, which will be significant, but a lot of improvements to the safety. Uh, not only on the interstate, because right right now there's congestion every night on a daily basis. There's congestion on the interstate associated with uh, entry and exit to Winslow Park. Um, so that will that will be improved. Safety of getting across the railroad tracks will be greatly improved. We'll have a, a very nice grade separated crossing. Both of these projects will provide grade separated crossing. It will open up. It will connect into Interstate Drive. It will open up economic development corridors. Uh, all along I-70, all along Interstate Drive. Uh, we see it as a real win for the region and making good use of the dollars that uh, would need to be invested for, for the interchange. Um, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so the financial plan, uh, what we're looking for is, is $4 million to expend on right-of-way acquisition under for both projects. Um, we kind of want to use uh, our dollars as wisely as, as we possibly can when it comes to expending them for right away. Uh, when we see that we have an opportunity to buy a, a property that does not have an active business on it at the moment, we think that's a good bet for everyone. When we, we've also had conversations with the uh, Super 8 Motel, they're at a place where uh, they might be a little bit more willing to uh, settle. Uh, with the city, and that particular building has to go away completely. So uh, we're, we're seeing it as a very good time to consider some right-of-way acquisitions for the Westville Parkway South project. Uh, we don't know how, what we're going to need in the way of right-of-way for DHP, primarily because we see condemnation on the horizon. Uh, we do know that we're going to have some expenses of either cash or in-kind uh, negotiations with the two development-friendly parcels. So we've kind of wrapped 
our needs together into, our, into one request for both of those projects, and we're seeking an 80-40 split for $4 million of right away. Is that the end of my slides? I guess the question of why, why couple these two into one request? I mean, I don't think they're two separate projects. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, I don't, I mean, in the past, they would stand alone each on their own and, you know, or can you give me the break of what percentage of the $4 million is going to each end, or you don't know yet? Or? Well, um, that's an interesting question, and a very good question. One of the things that we run into as municipalities when we publish what we're going to do with right away money is we find that the, the values of those properties suddenly go up. Somebody else buys them, we end up spending, okay, who knows, uh, your money is our money, our, you know, it's taxpayer dollars that, that go up in flames. This is an opportunity for us to go after uh, right away from a little bit more in the being in the driver's seat because they <coughs> use the projects and they're actually able to compete against one another and um, might in fact uh, induce some parties who might not have otherwise been so willing to negotiate with us to, to give to give us uh, a better deal. Uh, I have been purposely not getting terrifically specific on exactly what parcels we are looking at or exactly how much we think each one is worth. Um, mainly because, you know, we want to get the best deal we can for the parcels we know we need to, to have. And I, my, my feeling is uh, it may not buy everything out there. And maybe we will decide that one or the other project is going to have to go uh, first uh, over someone you know, getting stuck on right away negotiations. And so I think if we if we go after both of them at the same time, uh, with a little bit of flexibility, uh, we can assure ourselves of at least getting one going. Um, maybe both, you know, we, we might be able to get, get them all, get everything we need for both. Um, if we do, that's, that's our, that's our top end goal. But we can see that we may run into a property <coughs> on one of these projects uh, that wants to drag us through condemnation and ask for the moon and uh, put the project in jeopardy. It's a little tough for us to, I mean, it almost seems to me you'll have another potential <coughs> another request for right away that comes after the $4 million's gone because it wasn't enough. And, I mean, everything we do tends to roll up into whether you pay for design. A lot of times you pay for design, I hope you want to do the project. A lot of times, right, right away, I hope you're wanting, I mean, the long-term goal is to get right. these all done also. So I'm being here. Absolutely right. And I think you guys, have, you, you hear from all of us in the municipal uh, world what a challenge it is to get through the right way piece. It's a, it's a big unknown. Um, we, we just watched uh, right away condemnation occurring on the 61 key and tiny interchange. <coughs> And we're uh, kind of amazed at what settlements were actually handed out. Uh, I don't know if amazed is the word or scared uh, by the, the multiplier that was uh, acquired by the property owner. So we do know that we've got uh, some interested, development-friendly parcel owners at that interchange, but they're not all I can't come to you and say this is everything we need. Okay. Right, and I think maybe Provincial Parkway South is maybe a little unorthodox or maybe a little bit out of typical schedule as far as the way we're approaching the road board or you know asking for this assistance in the project. And a lot of that is related to what we've gone through is two corridor studies at this point. We have not finalized the design or even initiated funding for that final design. But what we're looking at is there are certain businesses, Susan mentioned in there, that are currently vacant, that are a key, and we everybody has known that Super 8 Motel has to go for this project to move south. So that eventual is, you know, approaching a time in, you know, in his business or career where there's sort of corporate upgrades that are basically, will be required over a certain time frame. So it's trying to make an arrangement with that gentleman at this time that maybe minimizes the upfront, or minimizes our cost now by basically not having to buy a completely retrofitted and upgraded hotel down the road. So it's really more of a timing matter than it is 
you know, kind of lumped together. And it is absolutely looking at ways that we're not pinning down the exact dollars we think on either project. So, you know, one of the, yeah, one of the bigger what-ifs on DHP phase two right now is we're, we're seeking, we're, we're underfunded by, we've got a gap of $5 million. We have to get that MoDOT cost share uh, acquired. And I, I can't, you know, with all certainty know that that's going to happen. Uh, but I do know that one of these two projects has to happen soon. Uh, because we're, we're really being strangled out there uh, in terms of congestion and economic development is not happening because of that. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, and, and then we do see some, some good opportunities with a couple of, of properties uh, for Westwood Park myself. So if things go really bad, David Oval Parkway, can't, we can't find the money uh, through MoDOT or some other means. Um, you know, this is this is a, another very viable, very good. Both of them are excellent projects. Uh, we understand that there's, you know, limited funds, and uh, we certainly value your concerns and, and share your concerns. We want to spend the money as wisely as we can. Any questions? application we presented will be for US 61 West Out Road and for many of you who have been in this room before this is this is a returning project we came back previously with phase one design and construction and just for kind of a preemptive here a little bit but just a brief update on that project is we're actively under construction anticipate completing that phase one outer road to connect the Piney Loop system there by the apartments at Piney Road to the currently rapidly finishing Lexington subdivision there along the outer road. So we look for that to be completed by October. And then what we've also asked for at that point was we wanted to get a little bit of an idea of a concept design for phases two and three. So kind of look at it here a little bit. Uh, our phase one is here in green. You can see in purple is the Piney P61 interchange, which good news comes along with this as well as the MoDOT just recently opened bids. And those bids were underneath the budgeted amount. So the county and the city just this week have provided our letters of concurrence for this project and we'll be moving forward with an award here within the next week to two weeks. So that's definitely an exciting project safety-wise for that entire mm -hmm. corridor of everyone traveling that on a daily basis. So this corridor, I think what we're looking at here is kind of a continued evolution of the 61 corridor and trying to proactively address some of the problems that are out there now. And they're only going to be compounded the further we go down the road and the more development occurs. So what we're looking at with phase two and three is a two section that would get us from Wentzville Parkway. We've kind of readjusted that alignment a little bit as you can see here. We were kind of coming in by quick trip there for a little bit. And based on this conceptual study and the analysis of the traffic and how that interacts and works, we've actually kind of rerouted that. We actually tee in and kind of come in right across from Project, uh, from Progress Park's football field. So what that does is the city already owns that piece of property, so that eliminates one need for a right of acquisition in the future as well as spacing out those signals and providing a little bit of relief for that interchange close to 61. Our last section, I know we've received questions on this in the past, is that's Big Rock Bluff through there. So that's what a lot of the concept study did, and you can see our alignment here swings up considerably. So the need for that is to avoid a right-of-way acquisition as well as a second one of those rock bluffs. So there's definitely a lot of work that's in the packet there shows that has gone into that concept. So that's one that is definitely kind of exciting. A little bit of location. It is a long project again. We're about 7,800 feet on phase two to get to Timber Trace, and then about another 2,000 feet to go from Timber Trace on north to Lexington subdivision or the extension and continuation of that phase one. What's the existing condition? I think one of the biggest things that's driving this from the city's perspective is the MoDOT with the Piney P61 interchange. It's not just the interchange project. It's the overall 61 safety you know, corridor improvements. So what that'll be doing is basically eliminating all that great crossings between Piney Road and Winslow Parkway. So as those go away, it'll be right in, right outs only for a number of fairly large subdivisions as well as commercial developments and businesses in that area. So we're already getting a little bit of the trickle in phone calls from some of those residents inquiring about what, what their future access will be and how that'll work. So a lot of that will be, be basically backtracking those residents and businesses will have to proceed north to the Piney P61 interchange, use the interchange, and then proceed back south to get to their businesses in the evening or when they're headed northbound. So we also are working with a quarter that has an elevated rate of accidents. 
as anyone driving through that is, it's an increased awareness zone for MoDOT, so that is a double fine zone that was implemented based on those safety conditions. Also, there's currently no direct link into the city, so anyone traveling the 61 corridor is just as easy to stay on 61 or jump on 70, and our residents don't really have the opportunity to not only come back into the city as far as economic opportunities and growth there, but as far as some of the amenities, as far as parks and other activities that the city provides. So this is kind of a continuation of that corridor and getting those residents directly back in to the city that they're part of. Um, and where we're at, and the reason that we're only seeking design on this project is it seems like every project we stand up here and present is worth north of $10 million. So, and that's kind of where we're at again. We're at about $12.4 million for the overall project. And I think it's one that everybody in the room sees that the projects that have come forward and will continue to come forward to you next month, that that is an extremely large percentage when you're looking at it just from the cities and counties funding. So I think we'll kind of talk about it as Susan already mentioned the uh, shovel ready concept, but really what we're looking at is this proactive approach. We want to stay ahead of the growth of 61. We want to complete the design, including right away and construction plans. And we want to be ready, shovel ready, for any opportunities that come along for federal funding or if there is any state funding that comes back available in the near future. That it's a much larger project than the city and county are willing to do, but if we have that design ready and in hand and can move forward with showing that we know what we want to do, that MoDOT has a facility along there that's accessed. It is kind of a continuation of the MoDOT out of road system that from our experience and now that those out of roads are in some ways in our phase one will be turned back over to the city. So while it's kind of a MoDOT out of road at this point, I would envision that a lot of those as they kind of shed system and look to kind of lower their annual budgets that those out of road systems would most likely be a city network at some point in the future. So there's our scope. What we're looking at here is about a $1.1 million project. Uh, the design at this point is about $880,000 from the county, $220,000 from the city. We would like to go ahead and proceed with this in a 2018 fiscal year. And last, what are some of our outcomes? We're two and a half miles of roadway and sidewalk trail. Our concept design really just reserved a clear corridor for that sidewalk trail. Not a lot of work on that, but wanting to make sure we reserve that, particularly coming up against box culverts and things like that for an easier extension or expansion in the future. Really, it's hard to measure a new roadway and what that means to the 61 corridor, but the overall goal for the area is the reduction of accidents and congestion. And of course, it does carry along with it some other opportunities for commercial development, particularly you come into Winston Parkway there. It does provide access to some parcels now that are a little bit limited. all we had on that project. If anybody has any questions on their project, I'm more than happy to try to answer those at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you.